All right. So I don't know if you guys know, but there are some really strange laws in Canada. So I was able to look up some of these, so I'm going to tell you some of the, the weirdest ones I was able to find. So in Petrolia, Ontario, it is illegal to whistle. I, I know, it's great. So a Petrolia city rep says that this unusual, unusual law simply aims to limit excessive noise between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., but according to an article on the town's website, yelling, shouting, hooting, whistling, or singing is prohibited at all times. In St. Paul, Alberta, uh, you don't have to worry about your kids sneaking out because it's against the law for anyone 15 or younger to loiter in a public space without proper supervision of a parent or guardian between 12.01 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, this is like a province-wide ban in Alberta. So Alberta-wide, it is illegal to paint a wooden ladder. So I thought, I'm like, what if you're painting and you're using a wooden ladder and you get, like, you spill paint on it? I, I don't know if you're breaking the law there, but just a little strange thing. And the last one I have requires a little bit of a backstory. Um, as some of you, some of you may know, uh, my good friend Colson, who goes to this church, he works at Tim Hortons. And I have this big bag of change, and it was all full of, like, loonies and toonies and quarters and dimes and nickels. And so... I used up like all the big change and eventually all I had left was just like a sack full of nickels. And I told Colson, I'm like, Colson, one day I'm going to come and I'm going to buy a coffee and all I'm going to use is nickels. And so the day finally came and I walked to Tim's. I knew he was working because I checked with him, and, but he wasn't in the front. So I asked, can, can I speak to Colson, please? And so he comes from the back and he's like, oh no. And I'm like, yeah, buddy, th this is happening. This is... <laughs> and so we... We exchanged uh, the nickels for the coffees. And I wasn't buying just one coffee. I bought three coffees. And the, co uh, the total came up to $4.50. And I paid all in nickels. And Colson started counting them. I'm like, no, 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 don't worry. I counted this. So. Um, so it's not necessarily breaking a law. But according to, there's a Canadian Currency Act from 1985. There are a limit to the number of coins you can use in a transaction. So if someone is paying in all nickels, the limit of any purchase is $5. So if it's over $5, the vendor has the right to say no to, like, I, I don't want to count that many nickels. So I was four fifty, so I was still within the limit. So I was, I was good. So, yeah, the $5 is the nickel limit. And if you're paying with all loonies, there's a $25 limit. So I don't know how many people would actually pay with that many nickels. Like, I did it once just to get that reaction out of Colson. So uh, so yeah, so Canada, and those are just a, a couple of the weird laws. And actually, when you read the Bible, more specifically the Old Testament, uh, the law given into the Israelites, you run into some very strange laws that don't make uh, very much sense. But there's also some examples of some great laws that are awesome that I wish, you know, that we could adopt as a nation. Uh, the one key difference, though, I want to point out between uh, these Canadian laws and these Old Testament laws is that the laws from Canada, they're, actually, they're given by people, and that the law found in the Old Testament was given directly by God to his people, and they were just starting to establish themselves as a nation. So yes, many of these laws are strange, but we have to remember that God has reasons for giving them. And it's actually really cool when you actually... Uh, study and look into these laws, you see how God has interwoven himself. And because, and because of this, many, there's many timeless principles from these laws that we can get by studying them for us today. So uh, let us pray, and then I'll give you some examples of weird Old Testament laws, and we will focus in, zero in on a really cool one. So let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for all of us that could uh, gather here today. Uh, God, I pray that you would uh, speak through me and that we would be able to just uh, learn something from your word. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the first example of a weird Old Testament law we find in Exodus twenty three nineteen, and I think we even have it on the slide. There it is. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. And you are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. So, like, I mean, like, the first part, you know, it makes sense, you know, bring God the, the first of your fruits, and then all of a sudden you get this 
this goat lot. I don't know where it came from. Just out of left field. So that, that I, I definitely think that this law falls into the, the category of weird for sure. And there's lots of other laws, like the Israelites, they weren't allowed to eat owls. Uh, they had to make sure that no one was going to fall off their roof. They weren't allowed to kill a burglar during the day, but they could do it at night. Um, and they couldn't eat the fat off of animals, and there's countless more. And like, if you read like, the first five books of the Bible, you can just get a sense for how many laws there actually are. So the law we're going to zoom in on today is called the Year of Jubilee. Uh, before we get into this, if I say the word jubilee, does anyone know what the word jubilee means? 50. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I have here in my notes, like it, mean, it can mean 50, but it's like as the most simply way I can put it is like a special event or an anniversary. So, and if you have your Bibles, uh, you can flip to Leviticus chapter 25. We're going to have it on the screen, of course. But um, we are going to start at verse 8, and we're going to read uh, verse 18. And I, but I want to say, like, and really the entirety of chapter 25 has to do and tells of, like, the benefits of Jubilee and what it's all about. But we're just going to start here, and then we're sort of going to do some hopping around to just some verses that stuck out to me that show how uniquely great the year of Jubilee is. So we're going to start in verse 8, and it says this, In addition, you must count off seven Sabbath years, seven sets of seven years, adding up to 49 years in all. Then, on the Day of Atonement, in the 50th year, blow the ram's horn loud and long throughout the land. Set this year apart as a holy time to proclaim freedom throughout the land for all who live there. It will be a jubilee year, a jubilee year for you. When each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and return to your own clan. This 50th year will be a jubilee for you. During that year, you, may, you must not plant your fields or store away any of the crops that grow on their own, and don't gather the grapes from the unpruned vines. It will be a jubilee year for you, and you must keep it holy. But you may eat whatever the land produces on its own. And the year of jubilee, each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors. Okay, so yeah. A little bit of a large chunk, so we're going to sort of break it down a little bit. And in verse 8, it talks about the Sabbath year. Now, another question for you guys. What is the Sabbath year? Or does anyone know what the Sabbath year is? I know it's like strange. I'm talking to you guys, and you're talking back at me. Um, so if, if you know what the Sabbath year is, you can just put up your hand. Uh, we can go with that. Well, it's a good thing I have the answer right here. <laughs> uh well, in fact, oh, say, so in my, actually, if you have your Bibles and you look at chapter 25, it actually tells you what the Sabbath year is before it gets into uh, the year of Jubilee. And so we're going to read uh, verses 3 to 6. It says here, For six years you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But during the seventh year, the land must have a Sabbath year of complete rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath. Do not plant your fields or prune your vineyards during that year. And don't store away the crops that grow on their own or gather the grapes from the unpruned vines. But you may, eat, you may eat whatever the land produces on its own during its Sabbath. This applies to you, your male and female servants, your hired workers, and the temporary residents who live with you. Land must have a year of complete rest. So that, that is, that, that, that's the Sabbath year, just a rest year for the land. So to figure out when the next year of Jubilee was happening, you're supposed to count off seven Sabbath years, equaling 49, seven times seven. Then it says in verse 10, on the day of atonement and the 50th year, blow the lamb's horn loud and throughout the land. Now once again, I'm going to stop. One more question. Does anyone know the significance of the day of atonement? Yes, my dad knows. Well done. <laughs> uh -huh. We're lost. Okay, the Day of Atonement was one of the most holy or set-apart days for the Israelites. It happened once a year, and this is when the high priest, he would perform some very uh, elaborate rituals to atone for the, uh, the, the nation's sins, for Israel's sins. And to define atonement is just a to become at one, at one with God again. I talked about last week in our kids' feature, uh, like there's a separation between 
us and God. And G- Jesus' ultimate sacrifice was able to bring us back together. And so this was the Old Testament way of doing that, to sort of reestablish that connection. Uh, so you have the, the tabernacle and the, later on the temple. It had a section in it called the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place. And the only person that could enter this place was the high priest. And he could only do it on this day once a year. So breaking this would result in the high priest's death if he did the ritual wrong or he entered on the wrong day. Or if anyone just decided, hey, I want to do this and enter this place, like they would be put to death. So this whole ceremony was not to be taken lightly. And this is for God to communicate to the people to understand that atonement for their sins was to be done his way, not their way. And so this, and the, also this day of atonement, it took place during the Jewish celebration of the new year. So once a year, it was like Israel, they were hitting the reset button. They were once again uh, doing this ceremony to be symbolically at one with God. So you have this atoning ritual. It's happening once a year. But then if you fast forward 50 years, you have the year of Jubilee. And what we're about to learn, it's sort of like a hard reset. And we, we, we read in verse 10, and like verse 10 is like, it is key in this passage. So remember that, because it's like it gives you a teaser of what the like, Jubilee year is all about. And going to verse 10, set this year apart as a holy, a time to proclaim freedom throughout the land for all who live there. And it will be a Jubilee year for you, when each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors and return to your own clan. So they were supposed to set this year apart as holy. It was special because, I mean, it only happened once every 50 years. Then it says, fr- then it says proclaim freedom throughout the land. I, remember, I want you to remember that. Proclaim freedom throughout the land. And Jubilee, it's a year when each of them could return to the land that belonged to their ancestors, and they could go back to their own clan, and go, essentially go back to their families. And this was a big deal, and we're going to find out real soon. I mean, we're going to finish reading this passage, eleven and verses 11 and 13. Uh, this 50th year will be a jubilee year for you. During that year, you must not plant your fields or store away any of the crops that grow on their own. And don't gather the grapes from the unpruned vines. It will be a jubilee year for you, and you must keep it holy. But you may eat whatever the land produces on its own. The jubilee, in the year of jubilee, each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors. Uh, so in these verses, we see some similarities from uh, the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee. Uh, they were once again not to plant any fields or store any crops. So it's sort of like a double Sabbath year. And then in verse 13, we see something we saw in verse 10. The people were allowed to return to the land that belonged to their ancestors. And so... This whole chapter deals with sort of two main themes, and I'm going to be very much generalizing them, and I wish I had more time. Like, if I was doing this chapter in a series, this would be, like, very much an introduction. Like, you could do, like, a four-part series on this thing. But to generalize it the best I can, uh, the Euro Jubilee has to do with two main points, uh, the redemption of the land and the redemption of people. So the people of Israel were going to regain their land and if they were in slavery or a hired worker, uh, they or their children could regain their freedom back. And all this happened by hitting the reset button. And so we're going to first talk about Israel getting, uh, getting possession or repossession of the land. Um, so God had a way to divide the land. He had it all planned out. And if you look in your Bibles, many of your Bibles have a map in the back. And it tells you which tribe got what land. And so God had the land division. It was all figured out. But I love how God says in in verse 23, he sets the land straight. He actually says he is the one that owned the land and that uh, they they were actually just tenants. And he says in uh, chapter 25, verse 23, the land must never be sold on a permanent basis. For the land belongs to me. You are only foreigners and tenants, tenant farmers working for me. So when the original owner, or the first person that got the land, sold the land, he wasn't selling the land. He was actually selling the amount of harvests until the next Jubilee year. And at any time the land was sold, the first owner, so the guy who was first in possession of it, he had the right to buy it back. And so the price of the land would be determined by 
how close the next jubilee year was. So say you're 48 years from the next jubilee, the price of land would be very high. And then say you're only five years away from the next jubilee year, the price of land would be super low and you'd get a great deal on it. Uh, so, yeah, and then... Da, 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 da. You might ask the question, what if the original owner couldn't like, afford to buy the land back? Because they always had the right to, to buy it back, but if they couldn't, God has that all covered. In verse 28, he says, but if the original owner cannot afford to buy the land, it will remain with the new owner until the next year of Jubilee. And the Jubilee year, the land must be returned to the original owners so they can return to their family land. This was to assure that the land would always go back to the first family that got it. This way it makes sure what it says is verse, verses 10 and 13 also possible. The people were allowed to return to the land that belonged to their ancestors because the land that belonged to their ancestors was supposed to go back to them, to their original family that first had possession of it. So that's, that's the first part of the reset. The, the land was redeemed. It went back to the, the first family that owned it. Uh, the second part of the reset is that the Israelite people were getting their freedom back. And there's like a neat little clause in here because if an Israelite, for example, was to fall into poverty, uh, they could sell themselves as a hired worker to sort of help, them, help themselves out. And we learn about this in verses 39 and 40. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell himself to you, do not treat him as a slave. Treat him, uh, treat him instead as a hired worker or as a temporary resident who lives with you. And he will serve you only until the year of Jubilee. So they could sell themselves, but God didn't want his own people to enslave each other. So he sets it up to have them as a hired worker. They would be a hired worker until when? Until the next year of Jubilee. When the next year of Jubilee happened, they could go back to their own family clan. So that's the relationship. That's what happens. Like an Israelite can sell themselves to another Israelite. But there's also a thing where an Israelite can sell themselves to a foreigner living in the land of Israel. Uh, if an Israelite falls into a poverty and is forced to sell themselves to a foreigner living in the land, the foreigner was still to treat them as a hired worker. And once again, just like how like with the land, how the first owner retained the right to be bought uh, by the land back, uh, these people who sold themselves to these foreigners, they retained the right to be bought back. So that means like anyone in their extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, whoever could buy them, could buy them back and they can have their freedom. In fact, the Bible even says that they can buy themselves back if they have prospered. And the price for them to buy back their freedom, it depended on the, until the time, until the next Jubilee year. So sort of like the land price, if they, they were a long time away from the next Jubilee year, the price for their, their freedom would be very high. If they were closer, the price would be not so high. But then this is the catch. If they still hadn't paid off their debt by the time the next Jubilee year came, it didn't matter because they were supposed to be set free. And we see that in verses 54 and 55. If any Israelites have not been bought back by the time of the year of Jubilee arrives, they and their children must be set free at that time. For the people of Israel belong to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So this whole concept of the year of Jubilee is really great. The land and the people were uh, released from, from bondage. Everything reset. And I mean, how, how cool is it that just... So say, for example, you have somebody who just has this unpayable debt. And like, they realize like, it would take like 100 years for them to pay off this debt. And that just the weight weighs on them, like them and their kids, and even their kids' kids. Like Now they, they could be stuck paying this debt off. And just how awful that would be for them. But then they realize, hey, wait a second. The year of Jubilee is near. Now, not only what they owe, like what they owe, they won't have to pay back, but now they can even go back to their families and go back to like their original land. So God really wanted his people to live in freedom, and this was supposed to be a way to help ensure that. Now, okay, I use the word suppose, and I want to be very, uh, very careful with how I'm going to say this, so... 
I don't want to come off as condemning or anything. So I'm, like, this will be a part I'm be willing to talk about after the sermon with you. But <laughs> there is no recording of the year of Jubilee ever happening in Israel on the national scale in the Old Testament. So like, it, there could be, it could be happening in small inst- instances. Uh, when you look at Nehemiah chapter 5, there's something like the Ju- year of Jubilee happening, but it's not quite yet, but that's also not Israel at that time. So, y- yeah. And if, if you factor in, if you're familiar with your, old, uh, with your knowledge of the Old Testament and how well Israel actually obeyed the law, if, if you're familiar with the book of Judges, they, they dropped the ball. Uh, you have the kingdom splitting up into two, and you have the nation of Israel in the north, and the nation of Judah in the south, and they're, they're still all Israelites, but I don't even know how the year of Jubilee would work during that time. So, given all these factors, and like once again, I'm very careful with how they say this, and I'm not, I don't want to come out across as condemning to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but on a nationwide scale, you can argue solidly that the year of Jubilee never happened. And I find that a little sad, because you could have the person... I just talked about who had this unpayable debt, but now they don't have this whole concept of what Jubilee is or was. They could be stuck in their bondage, unable to get out. See, the year, in, the year of Jubilee was not intended for anyone to get rich. In fact, it was a way for God to show the Israelites that, the, that their prize, of his being his people, so having eternal life and living in freedom, was to come later. And the, the year of Jubilee, it was supposed to be a picture of that. So Israel, like they were God's chosen, created nation to be his representative on earth. So if they did everything that God, that he commanded, the whole concept, like in Jubilee, like that whole, that it actually works. But since, like, they didn't, this whole concept goes down, down the drain. Uh, slaves and hired workers, they remain hired workers and slaves. And, and land is never returned to the proper owner. And no one is able to experience freedom from this unpayable bondage. So, what does this mean for us today? What significance does the year of Jubilee mean for us Canadians living in the 21st century? How do we live in it? How do we celebrate it? It's really uh, quite simple. Actually, Jesus is Jubilee. Jesus is our Jubilee. So remember, we, we briefly talked about the Day of Atonement. The day once a year where the high priest would atone for the sins of Israel. Well, our personal day of atonement can be when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And after you do that, you can have this opportunity to live in this constant state of jubilee, live in a, in a state of freedom. So this is something the Israelites missed out on. But we, we can do it now. We have that opportunity. So just uh, to wrap this up, I'm going to read an article I found on the internet and, the, and in this paragraph, the, the author, he gr- draws many great parallels from Jubilee and salvation. And he words it better than I ever could. So I'm just going to say what he says. And I believe it will be on the slideshow. If not, that's okay. It's, and it says this. The Jubilee year contains many of the pictures of our salvation. Just as the land and the people were all, and all the property was released, so we too have been released from the debt that we can never pay our sins. We were once slaves to sin, but now we've been released. Once held captive, but now set free. Christ's blood has atoned for our sins and satisfied the wrath of God that was due on us. And as the land was given us rest, we too had entered into his rest from all our works. For we can never save ourselves by our own works because salvation is fully a work of God. If you are not saved, then maybe you have asked what some have asked Jesus. What must... What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him in, in, him, in whom he has sent. All right, let's pray, and then I'll get the music team up here again. Uh, Father God, uh, we thank you. We thank you for Jubilee, uh, God. We thank you for Jesus being our Jubilee, uh, Lord. And we thank you that because of him, we can experience this, this freedom from this Un, unpayable bondage, something that we can never get ourselves out of. Uh, Lord, you did something for us, and God, we, we thank you so much for that. Yeah, I just pray that you'd be with us. Uh, 
this afternoon and throughout this week, then that would that'd be something that we could remember very simply, that Jesus is our jubilee. And we pray this all in your son's name. Amen.